Right before we jump into this video, have you downloaded my app called My Gear Vault? Well, if you're watching this, it's probably because you have a lot of gear. Well, it's the best way to input, organize, and protect all of that gear, and it's free for iOS and Android, so go ahead and download it right now. Jared Poland Frono's photo. Dot com and this is a real world review of the Canon EOS R, which is Canon's first foray into a full frame mirrorless camera. We got to try it out at the Pennsylvania Renaissance Fair where we shot the joust and portraits and candids and a whole bunch of different images. So now let's get to the review. The first thing I photographed at the Renaissance Fair was this guy selling incense. He kept yelling, you smell it, we sell it, over eight incense. And I thought that was a great opportunity to get some shots with him. Now I shot with the 28 to 70 F2 and got some full body shots as well as zoomed in a little to see how that lens would do. And that lens is honestly incredible. Expensive at $3,000, but a really good lens. The EOS R has a 30.3 megapixel CMOS sensor with a low pass filter. Now this is the same sensor that you will find in the more expensive Canon EOS 5D Mark IV, but they are saying that it has been optimized with the new Digic 8 processor, which means the ISO is expanded a little bit. There's an ISO range of 100 to 40,000, which is the same as the 6D Mark II, but I suspect it's gonna be much better in this camera. And it's also expandable to 102,400, though I don't think anybody will ever shoot at that high of an ISO. Next, I switched over to the 70 to 200 version three and got some tack sharp focus shots right on his eye. The EOS R has a brand new lens mount that Canon's calling the RF lens mount. Now it's the same size as the EF mount, but that doesn't mean that you can put your EF lenses onto this camera natively. There's RF lenses that will go on natively and you will need one of three adapters if you wanna put your EF lenses onto this camera. There's the basic adapter, which just lets you adapt your EF lenses to the EOS R. There's one that allows you to drop in filters. And then there's one with a control ring that allows you to change ISO, aperture, shutter speed, all from the lens adapter. Now these adapters do come at a price. The regular one is only 99 bucks, but it doesn't have the control ring. If you want the control ring, it's $200. And if you want the one that you can drop in filters, that's gonna be 400 bucks. Now, one thing I need to remind you of is when you switch from RF lenses to adapted lenses, you have to put the adapter on the camera and then put the lens on there. And I kept just taking off the EF lens and leaving the adapter on, which means that the RF lens couldn't go onto there. So for the next couple of years, you're gonna have to get familiar and used to changing the adapter and the lenses the right way. Another minor issue is you now have two different back caps. So you need to make sure you put the right one on the right lens. This camera can shoot up to eight frames a second. The only problem is it's not in continuous focus. Now you can shoot at five frames per second in shooting priority, or if you wanna do tracking priority, you can do three frames a second. Now for this entire review, I shot at five frames a second and didn't have a problem at all. Speed. I heard a bunch of ruckus behind me going, Speed. Speed. And I'm like, no, Steve is shooting video. He's, he's actually over there. So I quickly turned around and did some photojournalistic shots of the parade going by. What was great was being able to change my exposure quickly and see that my exposure was perfect inside of the EVF. What I love about mirrorless cameras are the electronic viewfinders. This camera has a 3.69 million dot EVF that when you are shooting and changing your exposures, you get a live view of exactly what your image will look like when you go ahead and shoot it. Now, speaking of shooting images, Canon does a little trickery when you're shooting continuous. There is zero blackout when you're shooting. That means the shutter is still coming down, but Canon is putting in the frame that you just shot for a split second to make it seem like there is no viewfinder blackout. Another thing you will like compared to the Sony is that it sticks out further than Sony's electronic viewfinder. So if you have a bigger nose like me, which is kind of medium sized nose, you may find that to be better. 
After we smelled enough of the incense guy, we walked over to something called the Lion's Den. And inside the Lion's Den, it is a leather works where they're making different items out of leather. Now, starting off shooting, I used the 70 to 200 wall outside to shoot through the window to get everybody working. That gave me a good opportunity to shoot some vertical shots, getting some foreground elements out of focus to draw me into the subject. Again, I had no problem with the autofocus, didn't have a problem bumping my ISO up just a little bit and that lens is really damn good. Unlike Nikon, Canon launched with a better selection right off the rip of RF lenses. You have a 35 1.8 IS, a 24 to 105 F4 IS, a massive 51.2 which is incredible as well as a 28 to 70 F2 which is what we're recording with right now. What's new with some of these RF lenses is that they have a built-in control ring. So you can control the shutter speed, the aperture, the ISO, which comes in handy if you're shooting stills or if you're shooting video. I still personally don't like control rings on lenses. As you know, I like to shoot the tights, the wides, the mediums, and the details, so I moved on inside, put the 11 to 24 on with the adapter, and started photographing the guy working on some form of leather. Now what I did do is bump the ISO up to 3200 because this was an F4 lens, and I really love how the black and whites turned out. Now being that we have a 51.2 RF lens in the bag, I broke that out, took the adapter off, put that lens on, Got some nice vertical portraits at 1.2, which also allowed me to drop my ISO back down and get some really cool shots. I also tried to get some detailed shots of the fingers as he was hammering something into the leather. Those shots look okay, those aren't the best, but I do have to say being able to switch around from all of these lenses to get my wides, my mediums, my tights, and my details really worked out well. A good use for the control ring for those of you who are shooting video is that you can fine tune your exposure in eighth stop increments, whereas in the past, you could only do it in third stop increments. During this real world review, I used the adapter with the control ring, though I didn't use the control ring at all. Moving on from the leather shop, I went ahead and shot a comedy troupe called The Mud Squad. Now this is interesting because they reenact some kind of story, some kind of comedy show, all while playing in the mud. Now they did warn people in the first, second, and third row that they are inside the, the splash zone. zone and may get some mud on them. Well, luckily for me, I was actually in front of the front row, which meant I was probably perfectly center in the splash zone. Like the newer Fujis and Nikons, this camera has a top LCD screen. Though I never really look at the top LCD screen, I wish they would take it out, and maybe you could save a few bucks by doing so. Being that I knew there was gonna be some sort of splashing in the mud pit, I decided to shoot with the 28 to 70 F2. Now I was sitting down front, which gave me a good opportunity to fill the frame with vertical shots at 70 millimeters and also shoot wider at 28 to get the entire comedy troupe in there. Now what I will say is I wish I had 24 millimeters because I love just having a little bit wider of an angle. But this 28 to 70 F2 is super fast super sharp and gives you great images. One of the head scratchers with this camera is that Canon has chose not to put in image stabilization on the sensor, whereas all the other manufacturers have started to put in-body stabilization into their cameras. Now they do have digital IS, but we don't recommend using it because it is pretty warpy, but Canon is still going all in on IS lenses. Keep in mind, if you're using digital IS, you will get a pretty heavy crop because what the camera is doing is cropping in to allow it to do digital image stabilization. Carl here! <laughs> King of the primates! One of the things that I thought might happen is somebody might get thrown into the mud pit, and so when I was focused on the one guy getting ready to be pushed backwards, I've locked in on him in continuous focus, and I had him in focus for the first, second, possibly third shot, but as he started to come down, the focus shifted to the background, leaving him splashing into an out of focus mud puddle. At the mud show, they said, beware the first, second, maybe third rows. I so happened to be sitting uh, in front of the first row, 
and I got mudded. So some people like to tell me that because my bag is usually nice and clean, that I don't actually go out and shoot. Well, now I can look like a real photographer now that it's all muddy. I'm a real photographer. Just like the Canon EOS 6D Mark II, this camera only has one SD card slot. Now it's nice that they updated it to a UHS-2 where the 5D Mark IV only has a UHS-1, but can you take this camera seriously with only one card slot? Now I personally love to shoot redundant and want to have two card slots at all times. Now is it a deal breaker for you? That's for you to decide, but just know with one card in the camera, if something goes wrong, your shoot is out the window. Let me jump in here real quick and let you know that this video is brought to you by Squarespace. If you're looking to build your very own website just like I did at jaredpoland.com, head on over to squarespace.com slash photo to get a 14-day free trial. And if you decide that it's for you, use the code photo at checkout to get 10% off your first order. Now let's get back to the review. One of the fun things at the Renaissance Fair is that they have a lot of mirth and merriment and games. Come on, Buttercup! So one of the people was yelling, hey, Bob Rivers, I mean, Bob Rogers. And I'm like, you mean Bob Ross? He's like, yeah, Buttercup. And I was like, okay, well, he was doing the hammer strength game where you take a sledgehammer, you hit something, and you try to ding the bell. Well, I tried it really? out. I got it as high as 64% of the way, and I don't know what I did wrong. I've got muscles that are this big, yet I failed at ringing the bell. Which way did the beach? That way that way, or is it that way? So it's more like play, get angry, and lose. Has anybody rang the bell yet today? Yeah. On that one? Yeah, you're just a buttercup. Now let's talk about autofocusing points. In this camera, there are 5,655 of them. So the whole camera lights up nice and bright like a Christmas tree inside. Actually, it doesn't because you can't see all of those focusing points. Now you can change the size of the focus box, but you don't have the ability to go to pinpoint to individually select 5,655 points, which is good because you probably don't want to. But what is great is you almost have full viewfinder coverage with your focusing points. You can go all the way to the top, all the way to the bottom, one box from the left and one box from the right. You basically basically can put the focus point anywhere you want it in your viewfinder and get the focus where you want it to be. Most cameras on the market today have a 3.2 inch LCD screen on the back of their cameras and the Canon has a 3.15 inch 2.1 million dot vary angle screen. Now vary angle means you can flip it out, rotate it. So if you are a vlogger, that may come in handy. But for me shooting stills, I kind of leave it just on the back of the camera and don't really worry about it. I was out searching for portrait subjects and I came upon an awesome looking gentleman with a huge beard, nice glasses, and some devil sticks. Now that gave me a good opportunity to break out the 70 to 200 and get some portraits, but also I thought it would be a good opportunity for testing out the continuous buffer of this camera. Yeah, keep spinning and spinning and spinning and tossing and tossing until the okay, hey, there we go. So I put on the 11 to 24 and started shooting photos and got to somewhere around 43, stopped, looked at Steven and said, Steven, I certainly hope I'm in raw. Do I have this set to JPEG because I'm not filling the buffer? Well, I in fact did have it set to raw and the buffer is 47 raw shots in a row. I guess it's a good thing that they put in a UHS-2 card slot and that I was using a pro-grade UHS-2 card. Now it's possible that Canon rated those 47 frames in a row based off of their eight frames a second if you were to shoot that. Being that we were shooting at five frames a second, we basically couldn't outrun the buffer. So a good rule of thumb is make sure you have a really good fast UHS-2 card in the camera. When you pick up the Canon EOS R, your thumb goes instinctively to where a joystick should be. Except there is no joystick, which makes it harder to move focusing points. But there is something called touch and drag AF, which I set to the bottom right hand corner of the screen. I find it really easy and quick to use my thumb on the back of the LCD to move the focusing points quickly to where I need them to be. And over time, I got much better at fine tuning it. So I didn't have to use the D-pad to fine tune and move them. Now I did notice that from time to time, it became nose AF movement. 
because I could actually wiggle my nose or slightly move my head and my nose would move the focusing points. Now, I wish we could turn that part off and just recognize my thumb or I just have a big nose and we'll have to deal with it. Steven, it's actually smaller than my dad and brothers. While on the search for some lower light situations to shoot in, there was a glass blowing den. We actually photographed there last year with the 6D Mark II. Now this time I stayed outside of the glass blowing area, used the 70 to 200 to get some nice verticals, to get some nice horizontals, as well as some detailed shots as she was blowing glass. You will be able to focus down to negative six EV, which is more than what most DSLRs can do because most of them are doing negative three to negative four. But there is a caveat. You need to use F 1.2 lenses and use only the center focusing point. Being that this is a mirrorless camera, you do have the ability to shoot silently. But unlike most of the other cameras on the market, currently you only get one frame. It's not continuous shooting. So as soon as you press the button, you take your finger off, press the button again, you'll get more shots. Now they do say that they will be coming out with a firmware at some point, but at this point, we don't have the new firmware, so we were just getting one frame every time we push the button. Now if you're wondering, how do you know when you're taking the picture? Well, a white box shows up every time you press the shutter button. Canon has done right with this camera's ergonomics is that they didn't try and make the smallest, lightest mirrorless camera. They made a camera that resembles a DSLR and how that feels in your hands. It feels substantial, it feels sturdy, it feels great in your hands. It's weather sealed just like the 6D Mark II. It has a really nice deep grip, which is better than what you would find on the Sony. And it matches what Nikon has done with the Z series of cameras. Now there is something that I don't like about the body and I don't like where they put the on off switch. It's literally a dial that shouldn't be there because there should just be a simple switch with your right hand that you can go off to on or on to off. If weight is a concern for you, there's really not much to worry about because it weighs in at 1.46 pounds, which is similar to what you would find in the 6D Mark II and almost the same as the Sony a7 III. After finishing up getting the shots of her blowing glass, I saw some ornaments hanging there, which gave me a nice opportunity to shoot some cool bokeh shots. One of the best situations to test out a camera at a renaissance fair is during the joust. So we walked on over to where the joust was going to happen to try and find a place to shoot from. Now last year with the 6D Mark II we shot from the left side of the field and this time we decided to go to the right side because it wasn't as wet because it just rained a few days before. Now one of the things that people are afraid to do with mirrorless cameras is change their lenses out in the field. The reason for that is that when you take the lens off of the camera, the sensor is exposed to the elements. Well, what Canon has done right is when you turn the camera off, the shutter comes down to protect that sensor a little better than if it didn't come down at all. As the crowd started to fill in, that gave me a chance to focus on some detailed shots for a few minutes. There were people riling up the crowd. Are you ready for the count? There were also squires setting up the different stations where the knights would get their lances, put on their shields, and put on their helmets. And I think I got some really interesting photos. There was one shot where the squire was behind the rack and I had a larger focusing point on and I couldn't get the focus on that person. But I quickly switched it to just a smaller single point focus and was able to get the focus right on the squire. This is the life of a camera shooting reviewer guy. It's sweaty. 
The horn started blowing and the king walked his way onto the field where he proceeded to point directly at me and say, Dilly Dilly. No, he said, Philly Philly, look at that guy with all the hair. So he pointed me out and then went on his merry way. If you're somebody who likes to switch quickly between shooting stills and shooting video, you'll be happy to know that you can set the record button to your custom three setting, which means whatever you have that set to, when you hit the record button while you're taking photos, it will switch to start shooting video with the exact settings that you set. Next up, the four knights entered the field on their horses, which gave me a good chance to use the 70 to 200 to start tracking the subjects as they were coming towards me or going away. I got some vertical shots, I got some horizontal shots, all in preparation of the joust starting. One of my favorite features in the Sony cameras is IAF. Now this Canon does offer you something similar, except it's not really ready for prime time. It's only available in single focus, which means you can't shoot in continuous focus until there is a firmware that is released. Now I did try using it during this shoot, but it just moves so slow. It's not as good as what you find in the Sony by any stretch of the imagination. Now it's better than what Nikon offers, because Nikon doesn't even offer you an IAF option. To quickly activate this feature, you could map out the AF on button, which would make it much quicker to get to than having to go through the menu. But until they come out with a firmware update, this is really not a usable feature. Let me jump in here to remind you that if you'd like to purchase this camera or any other camera, please check out the links down below that will take you over to Adorama. Now, when you make purchases there, it helps us continue to make this free content. And we want to thank Adorama for supporting us. So go check them out. One of the major things that I wanted to test with the EOS R was the continuous autofocus tracking subjects coming towards me, obviously action subjects. So to start off, we had the knights coming towards me trying to catch rings with their lances. And I have to say, I was not fighting the autofocus at all. It just felt like I was using a DSLR, except with the added bonus of being able to move the focusing points anywhere I needed them to be. Canon's autofocus is called dual pixel autofocus, which we've seen in the past come out for just video. Well, now that this is a mirrorless camera, they have taken that technology and put it towards shooting stills. And I have to say that it is a very competent autofocus system for capturing stills. Besides face detection, you also have an option for lock on AF. Now, I personally don't like relying on the camera to just lock onto a subject and track it. I like to manually move my focusing point using the expanded AF, and it tracks the subject perfectly fine in my opinion. Now, if you're somebody who wants to rely heavily on the camera to do the tracking, I think it will do an okay job. I just don't think it will do as good as if you selected the focusing point and track the subject yourself. Unlike the Nikon Z series that only offers you a battery grip for your camera, Canon did launch with a vertical grip that has all the buttons to change your shutter speed, your aperture, and shoot photos. You can also put two batteries in there, but there is an issue when you're shooting vertical. There is no joystick, which makes it much harder to move your focusing points because you have to stretch your finger all the way out to try and move the points on the screen or use the D-pad. But something that happens inside the viewfinder that will never happen on a DSLR is that all all of the data, the shooting data, goes vertical, so you don't have to try and look sideways to read what your exposure is. It's right there at the bottom of the frame. One of the things I noticed while shooting the Joust was how good my exposure was while looking through the EVF. I was able to get it spot on, which is a great thing that you can match your EVF to the final outputted image. The colors were nice and bright, but keep in mind when you shoot raw, it's gonna be more flat in the computer. But I also wanna say in the bright sunlight, it made it slightly harder to see through the EVF. And as I like to say, I don't wanna make that viewfinder nice and bright because that might not 
give me a perfect representation of what my exposure should be. If you have a lot of LPE6 batteries floating around, you'll be happy to know that you can use it inside this camera. But if you want to use the USB adapter to go ahead and charge the battery while in the camera, you'll need the newer battery, which adds an N to the end. Now you can only charge it with Canon's proprietary USB adapter, which sets you back 200 bucks, uh, which I don't think you actually need. Now let's talk about battery life because this camera is only rated for roughly 300 shots per battery charge. Now I had two batteries in the camera because I was using the vertical grip and took just shy of a thousand images throughout the day and the battery meters both said right around 50%. Now, if I was shooting with just one battery, I would think you should get close to five or 600 shots, as long as you're preserving battery life by turning off the camera when you're not using it. After a lot of passes shooting five frames a second with continuous autofocus, the camera was handling extremely well. I was able to capture one of the lances breaking on one of the nights, another night after getting hit, throwing the arms out and the lance going up into the air, and even one of the nights falling off the horse. Everything seemed to be hitting time and time again. A new feature you'll find inside this camera is a touch-sensitive multi-function bar, where you could tap it to the left, tap it to the right, or swipe your finger across to change a bunch of different settings. You can set it to shutter speed, ISO, turning on focus for video, turning off focus for video. Now in terms of shooting stills, I didn't even use this touch bar at all because when I tested it out to put it to ISO, my finger would accidentally go there, changing the ISO and ruining my exposure. So I personally turn it off for stills, but it does come in handy if you are a video shooter. Now there is an option to lock the multi-function bar, except the problem is, I have to hold my finger on there for one second to unlock it before I can make the change. And in my opinion, I can more quickly press a button and turn a dial than have to worry about holding my finger there to deactivate that lock. After the one knight fell off the horse, it was time for a sword fight, and not the sword fight that you're used to when you're six years old, an actual sword fight with really dull swords where nobody was gonna get hurt, but it made for good photos. So I moved around the field just a little bit to get a better view using the 70 to 200, and the focus did a hell of a lot better job this year than it did with the 6D Mark II. One of the video features that people were hoping to find in this camera is full frame 4K recording. Well, that is not the case this time around once again. You get 4K up to 30 frames a second with a heavy 1.7X crop factor, which is the same that you found in the 5D Mark IV. That does make sense because it's the same sensor that you found inside of the 5D Mark IV. Now, if Canon wants to challenge Sony, they're gonna have to start allowing you to shoot full frame 4K video. In this day and age where people want to replicate Peter McKinnon style and shoot 120 frames a second, you will only be able to shoot 120 frames per second at 720p. Now it does come with a major asterisk. It is baking in the file. You do not get audio and you do not get continuous autofocus. So basically, this isn't a usable feature. During the ultimate sword battle that wasn't very ultimate, two of the knights ganged up on one and grabbed him and started punching him in the stomach fakely, but it really made for some good shots. I was happy with how the autofocus was able to track the subjects and find the person that I wanted and wasn't thrown off by a knight in the background.
Just like the 5D Mark IV, when you're shooting 4K, you are shooting with a motion JPEG format. But in this camera, you do have an option for IPB, which is a lighter 4K version. Now, it's still a massive file size compared to Sony and Nikon, and this is something that Canon really needs to do a better job with. Because of your behavior, there is no winner. One of the issues when you're shooting 4K with a camera like this with such a heavy crop factor is when you put your wide angle lenses on there, they really aren't as wide as you want them to be. But for the first time with an adapter, you can use your EFS lenses, something like a 10 to 22, and shoot 4K using those and get your wider angles. If you're wondering how the video quality is from this camera, well, you're looking at it right now. We have the 28 to 70 F2 on the camera shooting at 4K at 24 frames a second. After the tournament ended, the Knights go out into the crowd to get some photos with the patrons, and that gave me a great opportunity to break out the 70 to 200 again to get some portraits, but this time using the eye detect mode. Now I switched into eye detect mode and found that it's really not for me yet. When they do come out with a firmware upgrade and I can shoot continuous focus, then it's going to be even better. But at this point, you don't have continuous focus there, so I switched back to the regular focusing mode, locked in on the eyes, got some really nice portraits, and I'm really happy with the results from those shots. This camera gives you the ability to shoot C-Log internally as well as externally to a recorder. Now we are shooting right now to the recorder in 422 10-bit. Now this is what C-Log looks like and this is what it looks like graded. After I finished taking the portraits of the knights, I started to leave that area and came upon a place where they were selling dragons. They were furry, they kind of looked like me, and they were colorful. So I broke out the 51.2 to give you some sample images of how the color RAW files would look. If you're somebody who likes to use manual focus for shooting either stills or video, you'll be happy to know that this camera does offer you focus peaking. There's also a focus guide that was borrowed from the Cinema Series, which is a nice feature to help you get your focus right. While walking around the Renaissance Fair, we came up to a place where there were crowns, not crayons, actual crowns that go on your head. I still had the 51.2 on there and I got some nice detailed shots at 1.2 to show you guys how that works. I wanted to cut in here real quick and let you know that we just released 14 custom Lightroom presets. Check out the different looks you can get quickly by using presets like Sandlot, Black and White Boomify and Kensington, Acid Wash, Wonder Years, Color Boomify, Skittles, and more. Head on over to fronosphoto.com slash presets to play with and purchase all 14 of these presets at 40% off for a limited time. Now let's jump back to the video. Sony and Nikon offer you zebra lines when you're shooting video and this Canon does not. So when Steven was shooting video, he had to rely on the histogram. The only issue is when you hit record, the histogram disappears. They need to get zebra lines in this camera. One of the last things I photographed at the Renaissance Fair was the falconer flying his birds. Now I was in five frames a second still with the 70 to 200 and I found that I had a little bit of trouble trying to track the bird flying towards me. They were flying pretty fast and I was shooting pretty tight. Now the question would have been if I shot the three frames a second with tracking mode, would it have done better? Honestly, I don't think it would have done much better because it's not easy to track the birds as they're flying towards you. But I was able to get a couple of good shots that were in focus.
This camera clocks in at just shy of $2,300. Now keep in mind that that doesn't include an adapter and you're gonna need to add that on if you wanna use your EF lenses. Now in comparison to the Nikon and Sony offerings in the same field, both of those cameras are under $2,000. At the end of the day, I had a great time photographing at the Renaissance Fair, and I highly recommend wherever you're at in the world, if there's a Renaissance Fair near you, go out and shoot some photos. But in order to determine how well this camera did and if I can recommend it for you, we have to head over to my computer to see how the images look. So now I'm back at the factory to take a closer look at the images, but I want to remind you that you can download sample RAW files over on the website that you can pixel peep to determine whether or not you like the files or don't like the files. Now before I jump into the computer to analyze these images, there were a lot of people talking shit on the specs of this camera when it was launched. I was probably one of them. But the problem is, if you base everything off of specs and don't actually use the camera, you're never going to know is it good or not. So let's take a look at the images right here. This one is done with the 28 to 70 F2. That is a monster lens, not only because it's expensive, but because it's pretty darn heavy. But if you're a professional, this lens should be in your bag if you're shooting Canon mirrorless cameras. I love this lens right off the bat, but it is super sharp. Even at f2, even though this one was shot at 2.2, I shot a lot of the images at f2. Nailed the focus here, moved the focusing point up to the top, got that right where I needed it to be. If you look over here on the right-hand side of the frame, you've got some nice colors in the background to go ahead and analyze if you would like. But that lens, oh my god, I love that lens. Moving on, 51.2 RF. Another great lens. It's still big and heavy and it's also expensive, but it is a great offering right off the rip. Now, I moved the focusing point vertically here. What is also good is that I used a vertical grip because Canon offers you a grip unlike Nikon. Now, I do want to say this. A lot of people talked about that joystick in this camera, or the fact that it doesn't have a joystick. I thought that it sucked because it didn't have a joystick. Right where my thumb was going, I'm like, there should be a joystick here, I said it earlier. But I honestly love the fact that I can just slide my finger across the screen. It's awesome, it's fast. So the fact that it doesn't have a joystick, to me, is not a deal breaker at all. This was only done at 400 ISO because I could shoot at 1.2, and even shooting super shallow like that, nailed the focus right there on his eye. Now moving on, put the adapter on. I used the 11 to 24 with the adapter with the control ring. Now honestly, if you want to save a couple of bucks, I didn't use the control ring at all. You could just get the adapter without the control ring. The adapted lenses, I had no issues with those. No issues using adapted lenses with autofocus. No issues using, of course, the RF lenses. They focused really well. This is at 13 millimeters. We're at 3200 ISO. I love the grain structure. Looks like film. Doesn't look terrible. Black and white looks nice, nice and thick. Uh, cool shot, Jared, nice job. I know, I like taking pictures, I, that's good. I can recognize sometimes. The reason I'm showing you this one is that I used a 28 to 70 again. I really wish that it was a little wider. I feel that if it was 24 millimeters, it would have been better, but how much larger would it have been and how much more expensive? Could I deal with not having the 24 in, in exchange for having a super sharp lens that has the F2? I think the answer to that is yes, though the 24 to 70 version for the EF mount is pretty light. It is super sharp. I just love, the, I just love this 28 to 70 so much. Moving on. Went to this shot and I had a larger focusing point on and wasn't able to focus on her. But when I switched quickly to the smaller focusing point, I was able to get the focus right on her where I wasn't able to do that before. So that's why I picked that image, just to show you that that was a possibility. Next, we have this knight walking towards me. So he wasn't running, but I'm doing continuous autofocus using the 70 to 200 2.8 version 3, which is so unbelievably sharp and fast, even on the adapter, it is lightning quick. It's much faster than the adapted lenses on the Nikon Z7, so I love the fact that the lenses focus extremely quick when they're adapted. I didn't think that Canon could make the 70-200 to any better, and I honestly didn't think that this one would be better than the other just with a new coating, but it crushed. 
This lens is a must buy if you need a 70 to 200 2.8. Expensive, but well worth it. Another thing to point out on this shot is that I'm focused up here on his eye. If I was using a 6D Mark II, there would be no way in hell that I'd be able to move the focusing points without having to literally lock in and recompose. That was one of the problems with that 6D Mark II, but that problem is not here on this camera. I just like this vertical shot. Again, I could move the focusing points edge to edge to nail his face right here. Boomified the hell out of it. Love the colors, love the clarity, love the saturation. I just like this photo with the, with the uh, King's Court up here on the right hand side. You got the King and the King's Squire and all those. I just thought it was a cool photojournalistic style shot um, and that's why I pointed it out. Now moving on, one of the things that people talked about with this camera is that if you want to get focus tracking priority, you want to shoot at three frames a second, not at five. I shot this whole thing at five frames a second and as you're going to see, well, as you're going to see right now, I didn't have any issues tracking focus of these subjects. But I got to stop because what is this line up here on the right hand side? I didn't see this when I took the picture. When I analyze these in the computer, I'm like, what is this thing? This is some kind of right error in the camera. Don't know if it was the car, don't know if it was the camera. This is the only picture in the whole thing where this showed up. I'm not sure what it is. I just think that there must have been a, a, an issue with the pixel readout when I was shooting multiple frames in a row. I didn't have anything else on the camera like an Atomos to possibly cause any issues. This just showed up. Uh, it didn't show up at all anywhere else, but just had to bring that out to you. But other than that, tracking the focus, continually tracking the subjects as they're going frame after frame after frame did a fantastic job. Like I said, so many people bitch that it only did three frames a second with focus tracking the priority mode. Not the case. I shot five frames a second. Didn't have an issue at all tracking the subjects, nailing each picture time and time again. Um, I picked this photo right here just because I love that the person lost their lance and it looks like they got stabbed and then on the ground really boomified this, got the focus to where I needed it to be. The year before when I shot with the 6D Mark II, I wouldn't have been able to react fast enough or get the focusing point where I needed it to be. So this shot is cool because of the colors, the tones, the sharpness, and then the portrait right here. The one thing I don't like in this camera is that it has terrible IAF. It's not the worst in the world, I mean at least it has it, but the Sony crushes it any day of the week. The Sony's gonna have better IAF but I was able to put the focusing point, sliding my finger where it needed to be to nail the focus on his eye at 2.8 with that brand new 70 to 200. That is a beautiful lens. I love everything about it. And to finish it off, I was tracking this bird. The bird came right towards me. Not easy to track a bird like this, especially with the mirrorless camera. It nailed this. And like I said in the, in the earlier part of the video, it didn't nail it every time but I really like this photo um, and that's why I'm sharing it right here. Now, one of the issues you may run into when you shoot silent is banding. That's gonna happen in every camera from the Sonys to the Nikons to the Fujis to whoever wants to shoot silent. I'm not used to seeing it at 1 400th of a second though. In this shot, you can see that there is some major banding going on in these shirts. Now that's just using regular lights up in the ceiling, their, their CFLs or LEDs, whatever they were, they're still causing flickering. So that's something you need to be careful of when you are shooting silent, is that flickering may be more of an issue even at slower shutter speeds with this camera. 51.2 with this, I just had to show this because I, I love this photo. This looks great, the tones, the color, the sharpness. 51.2, 640 ISO, loved it. Now for anybody wondering, how is the low light capability? Had the 28 to 70 F2 on, this is at F2, 10,000 ISO of Steven editing photos with a very dimly lit laptop screen, no other lights coming in, we drew the blinds, and not only is it tack sharp at F2, but the grain structure in this unedited, this is a non-edited photo right here, is beautiful. I, I can't believe how well this camera did in the high ISO. It just looks really fantastic. So now it's time to go into some final thoughts, flip the paper over and give you a little bit of a wrap up here. I loved the feel of this camera. What Canon did by making a larger size mirrorless camera, they deserve some applause. 
Definitely deserve applause for that. I love the RF lenses. They came out with some great ones right off the bat, and I can't wait to see what a 11 to 24 is gonna look like on this camera when they make a native lens, or the new 70 to 200 when they announce something like that. I love the RF lenses. Loved the AF speed, both with adapted lenses as well as the RF lenses. And I love that it has a grip unlike the Nikon Z7 and Z6, who just has a battery pack. Now, what I don't like is that it has one card slot, but hey, we've beat that dead horse enough. If one card slot doesn't work for you, then this camera isn't gonna be for you. But regardless of the specs, we all know that the specs looked really, really weird, and they still do hinder the video somewhat, but for still shooting, I loved using this camera. I kind of loved almost everything about it, and I think it is a great starting point for Canon. Now, now let me talk about this versus the 6D Mark II versus the 5D Mark IV. The answer is no. Put a fork in it, don't buy it, that camera is done in this world. I would go with this EOS R any day of the week over a 6D Mark II, hands down, anytime. Now, what about the 5D Mark IV? This is a tougher choice. I'm leaning to saying go with the EOS R and save some money. It has the same sensor, except tweaked to do better high ISO capability in this camera. You've got more focusing points. You have basically the same video features. You've got a great feel of the camera. You don't have a joystick, but like I said, I don't need that joystick, especially being able to move the focusing points quickly. You have two card slots in the other camera, though they're hindered card slots because you've got a CF card and then a slow SD card slot in there. So really some people don't even use both cards because it would slow down their shooting. I really think that the EOS R is a replacement regardless of what Canon said. I think I would buy that over of course the 6D Mark II and the 5D Mark IV. But the other question is this camera or go with a Sony a7 III or Nikon Z6. The a7 III is a fantastic camera. Though it feels like crap in the hands compared to this EOS R, you've got the IAF that works much better, you've got amazing video features. It is one of the best cameras honestly ever made. It's a well-rounded camera. If you're just starting out, you may be going to look at that Sony. Well, honestly, the Z6 isn't out yet. We know the specs, and we also have already done a real-world review of the Z7. I think it's a tough choice. It's a, it's a tough selection. I really like this EOS R. It may be an option that if I didn't have a camera to start with and I needed to pick between the Nikon and the Canon, it's possible I might have gone with the Canon at that point if I had to choose those cameras. But we'll have to wait till the Nikon Z6 comes out and then we can put those cameras side by side. So I really think there is a bright future for Canon here because they did a great job with this camera. The question is, will they kill the 5D Mark V as a DSLR and turn it into a mirrorless camera? Will they come out with a 1DX Mark III? Will that happen? I think they really need to make the tough decision and kill the DSLR lineup and go all in on mirrorless because they did a great job right off the bat with this EOS R. I, I'm really looking forward to seeing what the future brings. As you can tell, I really like the EOS R. So don't forget that you can download the sample RAW files over on the website. Don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe. And if you wanna check out the Fronos Photo presets, go to fronosphoto.com slash presets where you can purchase on sale right now 14 custom presets that look pretty good. So thank you guys very much for watching. Don't forget to let me know what you think down below. And there you have it, Jared Poland, fronosphoto.com. See ya.